I'm getting ready to build a brand new model railroad, MRR2. But before that, I need to build the bench work for it. And that's what we're doing today. Let's get started. Here is a complete list of all the supplies that you will need to do this build. Now, one thing that did save me a lot of headache is I bought this one foot by six foot board pre-made. It's gonna make it a little bit heavier, but it's actually gonna make it sturdier because I am gonna have to move this around. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get to building this one foot by six foot bench work for MRR2. First things first, let's build the legs. And we're going to be building L girder legs, which we're going to be using one by threes and one by twos to do that. Our legs are gonna be four feet tall because we're gonna have this layout at a tall viewing height. It also has to slide over my workbench because this is where this layout is going to go. So then we can get all of our boards measured out and then we can get to cutting them. And here are our pieces to be ready to be made into L girder legs. Here are the supplies you're gonna need. You're gonna need some clamps, some wood glue, some two inch screws, and a drill with appropriate bits. Now, if you have a finish nailer, you can certainly use that. I typically would, but I also like to demonstrate ways with tools that people are more likely to have, and more people are likely to have a drill rather than a nail gun. So I'm going to be building this with screws and a drill. First thing we're going to do is we're going to put a bead of glue on the 1x3 where the 1x2 will be attached perpendicular to it. We then bring our 1x2 in, line it up nice and neat because this is very important. we got to have that nice L shape and it has to be even. And then we're going to put our clamps on there to hold it in place as it dries. Now, you're probably wondering why did you need screws and a drill if you were going to do that? Well, we're going to use the screws to hold it in place while it was drying. I'm going to drill some pilot holes holes when you are doing this work on this thin of wood you're going to want to use pilot holes just because uh, the wood has a tendency to splinter so i drilled those three pilot holes and then i put three two inch screws in one at each end and one in the middle and then i let it dry And then it is a matter of rinse and repeat for the rest of the legs. It's just the process of gluing them together and then screwing the legs together. And then you just keep on doing it and doing it and doing it until you have four different legs. And then you're gonna let each one of them drop. Now it's time to work on the top of the bench work. So I grabbed my six foot board and then I actually was able to buy two other one by five, six foot boards so that I didn't have to do any cutting. If your local hardware home supply store has these, they are a nice little time saver. So I start by gluing them and then aligning them and clamping them in place, just like I did with the L girders. And then it's really the same process. I drill the holes and then put the screws in. And then I flipped it over and did the exact same process on the other side. Now we're going to take the tabletop and flip it back over. I need to put the end caps and the middle cross brace on. If you're using a thinner material for your tabletop, you might want to consider putting two cross braces at two feet each in terms of their spacing. I'm going to put one right at the three foot mark, which is right at the middle. But I'm going to take this other piece of one by five right here and mark it. And I'm going to basically cut three pieces out of it right here. So I go ahead and mark this and take this over to my miter saw and cut the pieces out. Now it's time to glue the boards in place as well as screw them in place. So start off with the end caps and we're gonna go ahead and push this one in. And I do have a hammer just because I need to tap it in place because it's a really tight fit. And then it's just drill the pilot holes and screw it in. Just more rinse and repeat. And I'm doing the same process 
for the other end cap as well as the middle support as well. Once that's done, it's finally time to attach the legs. Now, one thing you'll see me do here that may be a little weird is normally I do some sort of 45 degree bracing, but I do want these legs to be fairly easily removable because this layout is going to be somewhat portable. So I'm really not going to be doing too much bracing because of that, but I will be adding uh, three screws per leg just to hold them in place. And then it was just the same process on the other side with the other two legs. Now for a little bit of the stability, I wanted to put a cross brace just to support everything about 18 inches from the bottom of the legs. I'm using a one by four for this and all I'm doing is clamping it in place and putting some screws in just to hold it in right there. And this gives me a solid amount of stability and gets the framework fairly rigid. Once that was complete, I'm able to flip the bench work over and see how my handiwork turned out. And you can see this thing is pretty tall. It's four feet tall. It's got that viewing height. So, and I'm about 6'1", but here is the final bench work. Laying model railroad track used to be one of those things that kind of intimidated me about the hobby because if you get it wrong, your whole layout is messed up. But now it doesn't, and I'm gonna show you how I lay track. Let's get to it. Before we begin, let's take a look at the track plan for MRR2. This is an HO scale switching layout. Now the difference between this and what people would consider a normal layout is this layout is really designed to do switching operations and not much else. No continuous running, nothing like that. So what I have here are three industries, two oriented one direction and one oriented the other. We also have a runaround track and then we have tracks that go to the edge, including one where I'm going to attach some type of track cassette so that the train can come in and pull cars and it's also if I ever decide to build an extension or a larger HO scale layout I'll be able to attach this to it pretty easily. All right let's get into laying track. All right, so we have all of our track and we have our buildings that are going to be necessary for placing the track right here. These are just a couple of kits I assembled. So the first thing that I need to do is I'm going to put together the track in the rough plan. Now, to be clear, this is not the installation of the track. This is where I need to plot out where the track is going. If you have a really large layout, you can also do things like using uh, rulers for radii and things like that. You can also, a lot of software has features where you can print out the entire layout one-to-one -one and then lay your track out and mark where it needs to go. But this layout is so small that I can just take all of the track and just put it in place and then mark where I'm going to need to put down the cork roadbed. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Now the reason I have these buildings here is so that I can make sure that I get the track exactly where I need to go. On a layout as narrow as this, your spacing and precision of your placement of items is key. So I made sure to at least build the kits enough to where I could use them for placement. You can tell that my building front right there isn't quite done yet, but I built it enough to where I'm going to be able to see where it needs to go. So we're going to do that. Then I'm gonna take the flex track and everything and put it in place and make sure that everything fits properly. I'm using another piece of flex track just to be the piece that extends off the layout. Now, if you're new to the hobby, you may not know what flex track is. It's a pretty awesome product, especially if you're doing really custom 
track work. This is a piece of flex track. It's about three feet long. And basically what it is, is that it can flex and turn to a certain degree so you can get the right angles and curves and everything. And the way it works is one feature of it is that it has one rail that is rigid and stays in place and one rail that slides as you bend it. And you can see this one right here on the downside of this from this angle that moves and slides. Now that rail, you always want to be on the inside of your curve. Otherwise you wouldn't have enough to uh, connect to other pieces. Now the way it does this is one side is completely solid in terms of the webbing with the ties right here. And then the other side is broken up. You can see that the webbing has gaps in it and that is how it allows itself to flex. Now, because FlexTrack is a product for customization, you will need to do some modifications to connect it to track. Now, the big thing you have to do is cut the one or two ties. I like to cut the first two ties at the edge off right here, and you only need to cut where the webbing is solid. So I'm just gonna cut this right here, and then you slide it off, just exposing the bare rail, but don't get rid of those two ties. You're gonna use it later on to, you're gonna slide it back under it, and that's gonna make it look seamless. So you're gonna cut off those two ties so that you can slide the rails using rail joiners onto other pieces just like this and then you will be able to connect it to pretty much any other track. Now this piece of flex track right here has a little bit of a curve in order to get back to that building front. And what I'm going to do is since I'm just using it to mark it, I need something to hold it place while I mark where the location is that I need for the road bed to go. So I'm grabbing my favorite tool, those one, two, three blocks, and I'm putting them on here and using them to hold it in place as I mark everything and cut this piece of flex track to size. Now we need to mark where our roadbed is going to go. And to do this, I use a pin that I know I can see clearly. So I'm using a blue pin right here and I'm just going to be marking the middle line of the track all the way down. Now I only do this for sections where it is not a turnout. For turnouts, I also mark the edges because that's gonna be very helpful. So I'm gonna go through marking each spot and when I get to the turnouts, you'll see me draw around the edges as well. So this midline that I'm making right here is essentially going to be something that I do connect the dots with, with the uh, cork road bed. Now the cork road bed comes in half. I'll show you that in a little bit. And the reason that I'm putting these dots in the middle will make a lot of sense once you see that. But you can see also here where I have marked where the corner comes apart. This is probably the trickiest part of doing cork road bed is doing the cuts for turnouts, but it's really not that bad. And I'm gonna show you guys here in a minute. Now we need to cut the pieces of flex track. And the thing that we're going to use for that is a set of track cutters. I'll link some in the description below. But basically these have a flush and a non-flush cut side to them. And you can see right here, you wanna use that flush side on the part of the track that you're going to be keeping on the layout. That way you don't have a little pinch. So basically what you do is you go straight down the rail with these and you just cut and they work extremely well. They just like snap right through it and they don't leave that pinch which could lead to some issues down the road. As long as you're pointing the flush side towards the track that you want to keep on the layout. Now I can remove all of the track off the layout because it is time to start laying some roadbed. You can see all of my marks here. They may not show the best up on camera, but they look great in person. And you can see how I have a pretty clear outline of where my roadbed needs to go. So let's grab some cork roadbed. This is from Midwest Products. This is HO scale cork roadbed. I don't need this much. This is 25 pieces, but I couldn't find any smaller amounts right now. So I've got plenty of extra roadbed. So the way that this stuff comes is it comes in a strip that has a terrible section. And the terrible part has an angle which is going to be the angle of the slope of the edge of your roadbed where you put your ballast on it 
And what you do is you just tear apart down this middle line. It comes apart extremely easy. It leaves a little bit of an edge. We'll deal with that later. But what we're going to do now is basically you flip them and then the angled edges go on the outside and the perfectly square edges go on the middle. And you just line them up on that middle dot and you do that connect the dots with the outline that you just drew. This is what you need to put this stuff in place. You're gonna need some sort of adhesive. You can use latex caulk if you have plenty of time to let it dry. I'm going to be using Loctite Power Grip. This stuff takes a while to cure, but it'll dry fairly fast. You're also gonna need some sort of box cutter or utility knife and some push pins to hold it in place while it dries. This Loctite Power Grip all-purpose works really great. We're gonna be using a lot of this in this project. So to begin, let's go ahead and start tearing up our strips of cork and laying them down along those middle lines. And here's a quick demonstration of what I was talking about of how the uh, angled edge goes on the outside and the uh, perfectly square edges go on the middle. That's what it'll look like right there. Now it's time to start gluing the track down and I put down a bead of that Loctite power grip and here it goes and what I'm doing is basically putting it right near the edge of the dots. Remember when we we're gluing each side of the roadbed down. So I don't put it down the middle because I don't want it to not fully get one piece or the other. So I put it just off center so that I can lay that one piece down. Then I'll just lay my piece of half road bed in place. And one thing about this that you're gonna see me doing is I'm doing the outermost of the road bed first. And you'll also see that I'm smoothing it out here. Um, one great tool for smoothing out is those one, two, three blocks. They work great for smoothing this kind of thing out. But you wanna do working outside in because it's kind of, it makes it a lot easier and you'll see why in a minute. You can see me using that one, two, three block to smooth it out right there. But Working your way outside in with your cork row bed rather than just going down the line is gonna make things a lot easier for you. So if you have a lot of turnouts right here, work your way outside in. And then I'm just gonna take my push pins and I'm gonna put four or five in this particular piece just to hold it in place until it dries. Obviously those aren't gonna stay in place because you can't put track on it with, uh, with the uh, push pins in place. So this will be there just to let it dry. This is a lot of rinse and repeat when you're putting this down, but you, again, you can see that I'm doing that outside line first. And this is gonna give you a good guide of where you can put your cork row bed when you have to start cutting it in some angles to be able to do your turnouts. And we're gonna to get to that here in just a second. Now it's time to do the first turnout. I'm gonna be doing this one right here. And the initial part of it, we're going to be doing the outside edge of the turnout rather than the inside. So we're gonna go ahead and start where we did with the very first piece and then cut around and then follow the divergent route on the outside of the turnout. Again, this is just a lot of rinse and repeat. We're starting on the outside of the other side now that the roadbed is starting to come over from that first turnout. And this side actually has a siding on it, this line will. So we'll have to cut our roadbed and you just use a utility knife for that right where you need it to. Now for the inside portion of the turnout. The way that I do this is I take a piece of cork road bed and I will line it up right with where the merge point is with the turnout. So I need to put this right here and then I will take my utility knife and just cut right along that line. Now it is cork, so you may have some breakup happen with this kind of precision cut. Don't worry about it. You can always just glue it in and push it back together like a puzzle piece. But I just basically use the line that I've already made with the outer edge as a guide and I cut it right away and just cut it right down that line. I like to line up the far corner. You can see right there with right where the edge point is and that's gonna make it really easy to know where to cut. Once you have your fit, the rest of the process is identical. You're just gonna take your glue and make a bead and then push it down and put the push pins in place to hold it in place.
and then it is just a rinse and repeat process with everyone to use that same technique to get the angles on every turnout section and it works great it's a very simple technique and it works very well again you may have some pieces fall off that aren't perfect you can also use any of the cork you can see i have some scrap that has fallen off a little bit right there you can use some of that to fill in the gaps you just want to make sure that you get everything nice and level and if it isn't perfectly level you can also take a piece of sandpaper or a sanding block to it and you can sand it out nice and level as well now once you have everything cut and push pinned in place and you're leaving it to dry, you want to leave it and let it dry overnight. I'll always follow that rule of when in doubt, let it dry overnight. And when you come back, you'll have a nice solid road bed ready to go and lay some track. All right, it's the next day and we're gonna go ahead and pull all of our pins out and we're actually gonna start putting the track on here. Now I'm doing this for a different reason than you might think. I need to drill some holes for some things that are very important to have drilled before any track gets glued down. To understand what holes we need to drill, we need to take a look at a turnout. This is the turnouts we are using. The first thing I need to say is that we're using under table mounted switch machines to throw these switches. I will not be doing any manual throws like caboose throws or anything like that. I'm going to be using tortoise switch motors and there needs to be a quarter of an inch hole for the control rod to come up and be able to throw the turnout one way or the other. The other hole that needs to be drilled in advance is a hole for a power feeder for the frog of the turnout. Now what is the frog? That's the little part right here on the inner rails of the turnout where the uh, train diverges right here. You may be able to see this tiny little piece of plastic on each side and that that basically electrically isolates the frog. Now we need some power to go to that because it is a potential stall point for our railroad. So we're going to drill a hole for power to come to that frog. Now there is some complications with the frog that we'll need to address, but I'm actually going to do that in a whole nother video. But these are the two holes that we need to drill. So I basically mark the holes. I'm using the push pins to mark them and then I'm going to drill the holes and then I can attach the track. So I need to get the holes drilled for all five of the turnouts and then I can start putting down track. And this is just more rinse and repeat. I gotta do it for the other four turnouts. Now, if you're doing manual throws like caboose throws, you don't obviously need to drill the hole for the under table switch machine. But I do recommend that you do have some sort of device controlling your throws rather than just uh, flicking it by hand because these are Atlas number four turnouts and they don't have any sort of spring loaded action. They need something to hold them in place. So you may have some pain in the butt derailments if you don't have something like a caboose throw or in my case, the tortoise switch machines something to hold them in place as they when they throw to a certain position. All right, now there's one last thing that we need to do before we can start gluing track to our road bed. Now, if you look closely at the edge of the road bed, you can see where we tore it apart. There's still a little bit of a lip and an edge that's going to be a pain when we go to ballast our track. So we need to smooth out the angle that the road bed uh, slopes down to that's gonna do in real world to have runoff and things like that. But we need to get rid of this edge. So what I did was I just took some sandpaper and folded it up and uh, you can see you just kind of run it across and it's not that difficult to sand. It's just one of those tedious processes, but trust me, you're going to want to do this with your cork road bed. Get those edges nice and smooth so that when you ballast, your ballast looks really, really good. This is one big thing. Now you don't have to use sandpaper, you can use sanding block. As long as you can get that edge nice and smooth and looking great, that's all you got to do. Now it's finally time to glue the track down and I'm using the power grip again. Some people nail their track down, that's totally fine, but I prefer gluing the track um, just to get, uh, I don't like the look of the little pinhead nails in there. So what I do is I first I do my little bead of glue and then I flatten it out smooth. And what I will do is basically just run it as much as I can. You'll notice that I'm avoiding the areas where the turnout points are, where they move. I'm also avoiding the hole where the, 
uh, control rod for the turnout motor is going to come through and I'm also avoiding the hole where the wire is going to come through for the frog but I go ahead and press that into the glue when it's nice and flat and then I'm going to bring some push pins and just push it down along the rails and that will hold it until it dries. And then it's just more rinse and repeat until you get everything nice and glued down. Like I said, the thing you just want to avoid is the parts where the turnout points are going to be moving. And you also want to avoid those holes that you just drilled. The only thing that is slightly more complex is when you're gluing down a flex track that has a little bit of a curve in it. Now, you're gonna see me put this in here. Now, normally it just ma doesn't matter where you push pin it, you're just going to be going down the line. For a curved flex track, what I like to do is do the push pins that hold the curves first. I start off with the beginning and the end of the curve, and then I also put one at the middle so that I can hold it on that perfect angle. And this will just make it a lot easier to help dry in place and position as well. But after you get that curve down pat, um, you will have no problem putting the rest of the push pins in. Again, it's only barely more complicated than doing a regular track. Last thing, hey, remember those ties that we saved that we cut off? You just wanna take them and slide them in place and then your turnouts where your flex track is are gonna look pretty seamless right there. So you just wanna do that. You may need to put a little bit of glue on them. I had to do that for one of them, but once you push those in in place, you'll never really be able to tell the difference. Now just leave that overnight to dry. And here is the completed track work. Obviously, I haven't done any wiring and there's still a lot more electrical work to do, but it's a good start. This is a Tortoise slow motion switch machine from Circuitron. I'm using them to remote control my turnouts on MRR2, and today I'm going to show you how to install them on your bench work. And yes, the layout's on its side. A Tortoise slow motion switch machine it uses a stall motor and a large gear ratio to slowly throw a turnout one direction or the other. When the turnouts close to one point or the other, the motor will stall and that stall will hold the points in place until it swings to the other direction. Tortoise switch machines are mounted underneath the layout and use a very thin metal rod that goes up through the bench work and connects to the turnout which is what throws it back and forth and that is what we are doing today. When you get a tortoise switch machine, you get four parts. You get the motor itself, then you get a metal rod, which you'll need to bend. There is a guide in the instructions to bend it. It's really easy, I promise. Then there's a screw that you'll put in just below where you insert the rod that will hold it in place. And there's also a little plastic slide that's going to adjust the angle that your tortoise switch machine can throw back and forth to. And that's good for adjusting when you actually get it in there to fine tune it on the turnout. To assemble the tortoise switch machine, I have found that it's easiest to bend the rod by sticking it in the little hole that it's going to and then simply bending it with your thumb. Then you slide the adjustment piece right over it. And then last but not least, you take the screw and you screw it into the hole and voila, you're ready to install your tortoise switch machine. The motor that is in these things it moves slowly so that it looks more realistic than say snap switches and also since they are under the table they are completely hidden and don't ruin any illusions of reality that you are trying to achieve. Okay, I've got my layout up on its side so it's a little bit easier to show you guys. Also, perks of a small layout right here. Uh, I got my tortoise switch motor. I've got my marker for marking where I'm going to need to drill holes to install this thing. And I've got my hole right here that I drilled in the last video when I installed the track. If you haven't watched that video, go ahead and pause it and go right there. I'll put a time code link in the description below so you can go right to that spot. 
So we're gonna go ahead and put this in. And when I look through here, I can actually see the little hole that the little pin wire has to go through to go into the turnout and be able to activate it. So what we're gonna do is we're just going to fish it through. And when you do this, you wanna make sure that you're lined up in the middle and have the turnout lined up in the middle as well. So we're gonna go ahead and fish it through. Make sure we are in. Okay, now you wanna do a few little pushes back and forth. And you just wanna make sure that your turnout is growing properly when you do this. So, and make sure that it has enough force to be able to hold the turnout points where they are. We're not obviously gonna drill all the way through the layout. We just wanna put a little bit of a hole in there so that the tortoise can have the proper mount points. So we're just gonna take our Sharpie, mark it, And there we go, we now have four nice marks. Now I test the turnout by throwing it back and forth nice and slow just to make sure that it is throwing everything properly and then I do any adjustments that are necessary. Yes, that is a train running on MRR2. We're going to go over how we got to that point in this video. Welcome back everybody. Before we get going, I want to show you the finished product right here. This is my DCC bus, pretty much completely wired. It's got a few more things I need to add to it. But what I've done basically is I've wired an entire system in a parallel. So what I have right here is I have my main bus. This connects directly to my DCC system, which in this case is DCC++ EX, and then connects to all the different sub buses where the bus line goes. And you have like this one right here, which is the main track bus, which does the majority of the feeders and then you have some smaller connections for a couple things that I'm going to get to later on in this build. But And then from the sub buses, you have wires connecting the feeder wires going to the tracks. Here's a quick little diagram of how I do my DCC bus set up in parallel. You can see how I have the distribution bus that comes directly from the DCC system, and then it splits off onto the different sub buses which connect to track and accessories. The big thing about using a parallel system like this is A, it makes it a lot easier to find issues if you have them, and B, it's gonna cause less issues in general. So you don't have to worry about a whole system in series where if one messes up, they all mess up. So I'll be able to isolate which one is messing up and it makes it a lot quicker to troubleshoot. So let's get into installing this DCC system. When we last left off, this is where we were. I had installed the turnout motors and it was time to do some DCC wiring. To do this, I was going to be using some of these inexpensive terminal strips. And what I need to do was link one side of them together completely. That way they would work as one giant connector for one wire of the two bus wires that I would need for the DCC system. Now the pack of these that I bought came with these connectors right here and I will link that in the description below. Next up we need to attach these. All I'm doing is using a screw that fits properly and then just making sure it's not too long as it won't poke through the back. I then installed the second terminal strip that I'm going to be using for the red wires. For my DCC bus, I'm going to be using red and black for the colors and it's important that you use two different colors. The reason for this is if you get your wires crossed, you will have a short and your DCC system won't run. Next up, I need to create some pass-throughs in the center support joist of my layout. So I grab a one inch spade bit and go ahead and start drilling through so that I can have two pass-throughs through my layout for wiring. Once that is done, I put in all of my different DCC terminal strips in and then I can start wiring the track. 
Now there are a lot of different rules of thumb for how many feeders you should connect a track. I've heard one every three pieces, especially if you're using flex track. I am going to be putting a connection on every different section of track. To make the holes for the feeders, I'm using a 1 8 inch drill bit and I'm slowly going making a hole in between two of the ties. Now, one thing that's very important is you want to go through and you want to make the hole as clear as possible. So you'll see me go down and up a couple times just to make sure that everything's clear so the wire can be fed up through. In order to add a little bit of realism, I space out where my connectors for each rail go. I put one right here and then I'll put the other rail a little further down. I don't like to have them at the same location because it can do a little bit of illusion breaking when you are putting everything together. And then it's just a matter of rinse and repeat, drilling those holes, making sure that every section has feeders so that it is operational. We don't want any breaks in current, especially on a layout this small. We want the uh, DCC system to be rock solid so that we don't have anything going on. Another thing that I do is I take a Sharpie and mark where each one of the holes for the feeder wire is. Obviously we're gonna cover this up with paint and scenery later so it doesn't really matter how much we mark, but this just makes it a little bit easier to find them when you are working through this because it can actually be a little difficult to see exactly where you're working. So I'm just taking this and marking each hole. Now what I'm doing right here is a headache saver right here. I am marking what color each one of the holes is so that when I'm threading the feeders up through them, I will not have any issues with getting the wires crossed and causing short circuits. So I'm just looking and double checking my connections and just marking which one is which and this makes life a lot easier, especially when you're trying to find short circuits. Now it's time to warm up the soldering iron and get to work. I'm going to be soldering my feeders, obviously, because I'm bringing out the soldering iron. The first thing that I do is I apply a little bit of flux to the area where I'm going to be soldering. Flux helps burn off any impurities when you are soldering. So putting a little bit of this on there will make your connection more solid. Next up, I have a flat tip on my soldering iron and I'm going to preload some solder on it. This is gonna make it easier to solder. I'm gonna put a little pad on there so that the connection can be made easily. So I just bring my soldering iron and touch where I put the flux on there and then it will seep in there and make it easier to make the connection. Notice how I'm slowly pulling it across. This is where the flat iron helps out a lot. This will help the solder be a little bit flatter and you don't have bubbles of solder on your track that look unrealistic. Next, we feed our feeder through here and it is 22 gauge solid wire and I'm going to give it a nice little bend so that A, it doesn't fall back in the hole and B, we can go ahead and put it into position for soldering. The first thing I'm going to do is tin the tip of the wire. Notice I've already stripped it so that it was a lot easier to do and I didn't have to do that when I pulled it through. Then you feed the wire back through to where it's minimally showing and bend it into position. This is where the solid wire really comes in handy. Not only is it going to be easier to hide, but it's going to be easier to maneuver into a position where it's gonna look realistic and it's gonna be really hard to see those feeders. And I'm taking just some screwdriver, just whatever tool works best right here, and I'm really pushing it into the rail right here just to get it as close as possible just so I can have that wire as hidden as possible. I'm not worried about anything with the uh, ties or anything like that. They're all insulators, so I'm not worried about the bare wire. Obviously, they're touching the rails, so nothing's going to go there. But I do that, and then I'm going to bring my soldering iron back in and connect the two with the solder that's already on both the pad and the rail and where I tinned the tip of the wire. Now one little neat trick I found is these little wire strippers, which are pretty standard wire strippers, are actually fit perfectly in between the ties to push the wire even more in place so you can hide the wire even better. And now it's just a lot of rinse and repeat, just going through and soldering all of the connections and just making sure that I get them as flat and neat as possible. So this is where you really wanna take your time because if your layout doesn't work right, then you could have some issues. Then you can connect your feeders to all of the proper terminals that you have here and then get everything connected up. This is another place where having the wires with standard colors that you've decided on will save you a bunch of headache. 
Next up, let's solder some of the rail joiners together so that we have as solid of connections as possible. So the first thing you want to do, just like when you're soldering the feeders on there, is put some flux on there just to burn off those impurities. Then once you're done, you can preload some of your solder onto your tip and then just kind of gently pull it across the joint. And it should flow fairly well right there into the web of the rail. All right, so we have everything wired, but it's kind of a mess. So I'm gonna take my staple gun right here and just kind of get all the wires neatened up. Now, if you're not comfortable using a staple gun, you can always use wire clips or something like that. You just need to be careful not to pierce the wires with the staples, which this kind of staple gun has a good guide for it. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on that. All right, we've got everything hooked up. The DCC++ EX system is hooked up underneath and powered on. So all we have to do is power on the locomotive and we have this cheap little Bachman with some sound on it. So we're gonna go ahead and turn on the sound. So far, so good. Get some bells. Now for this kind of layout, slow speed is critical, so let's go ahead and give it a test. So far, so good. Uh-oh. Now, that is an issue. That is a little stutter that happens as the train is going over the frogs on the turnout. And in our next video, I'm gonna go over how to fix that. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Until next time, I'm Jimmy from the DIY and Digital. Stay safe, be kind, and happy railroading. This happened in my last video. Uh-oh. Now, that is an issue. To fix that, we're gonna use these. This is a frog juicer from Tam Valley Depot. Specifically, this is a mono frog juicer and it is designed for a single turnout. Now, why is it called a frog juicer? Well, a little part in the middle of a turnout where the tracks diverge, that's called the frog. And in my case, I need to power the frogs because they're electrically isolated. Now, you're thinking, why can't you just run a wire to that? Well. That will work for one particular way that the turnout's thrown, but the other way, it will cause a short circuit. So I need something that's going to flip the polarity of the DCC signal that's going to it so that we don't cause a short circuit. Now, there's a couple different ways you can do this. This is the easiest. This is simply an automatic polarity changer for the turnout frog. So I'm going to use these. I've only got five turnouts on here. So these things aren't the cheapest things, but if you're doing a small layout like mine, uh, you can definitely use these. So let's get started. All right. This is the turnout that was giving us issues last time, and this is the frog in question. And now you'll notice with the Atlas A, they have a couple of spots where there's a little bit of plastic that is isolating the frog from the rest of the track, which is where our lack of connection issue comes from. And then we also have this little spot right here that has a little hole right here that you can connect a wire to. Now, if you were to strip everything away, you would see basically just a metal section that is the frog being in a little plastic cradle around it. And then you have the rails. And then there's actually some metal pieces that go underneath this, um, underneath the plastic that connect these rails to these rails right here. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take our drill and we're gonna drill a hole right here. And then we're gonna run a wire and we're going to attach it right here. So let's get to it. Okay, hole drilled, so let's get to wiring. I'm going to be using some 22 gauge solid wiring and I'm going to be using green for these just to give it a little bit of a different mark because I have red and black below and then green will just tell me that this is the wire that is going to the frog. So I've got my hole, let's go ahead and stick some wire in it. Here you can see me bending the wire in a U shape so that it hooks into the hole. 
Next, it's time to solder. I start by coating them with a little bit of flux, and then I bring in my soldering iron and connect the wire to the frog. All right, I'm back underneath the layout right here. I've got the wire that I just ran and connected. You can see I put a lot of excess, and that's just because it's a lot easier to take away wire than it is to reconnect it. So I've got my little sub bus right here. So somewhere in between this DCC sub bus and here, I'm going to need to put the frog juicer. And it's going to be a pretty simple process. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Now, one thing you will notice about the frog juicer is it has no holes for mounting. So what we're going to do is we're going to use one of my favorite mounting tools for circuit boards, and that is hot glue. Hot glue is an excellent insulator, and it's going to hold on well, but it will also come off fairly easily if you need to do some change-ups. So we're going to put some hot glue on the back right here and stick this exactly where we need it to go. Now there are three terminals on this frog juicer. The outer two terminals are for the DCC wires and the middle one is the one that's going to go to the frog juicer. So you're gonna see me hook up a black and a red wire on the outer terminals and then hook up my green wire on the middle terminal. Once that is done, I can hook up my DCC wires to the DCC sub bus I have set up over here, and that's it. All right, we've got the frog juicer hooked up and in place, connected to the DCC bus. Make sure everything is hooked up the way it is supposed to be and it looks like it is. So let's go ahead and flip it over. All right, we've got everything wired up. We got a locomotive on the test track and we're going for this turnout right here. Let's go ahead and give it a shot. All right, that's one direction. Let's try going backwards over it. And there we go. This is a lot of wires, and I'm not really the best at cable management. But what this also is, is my DIY system to control these tortoise switch motors using an Arduino. Yes, MRR2 is back up on its side, but we're putting in some heavy electronics here and we're getting pretty close to where we can sit it back down for good. And today I'm showing you guys the installation of my entire switch control machine that is Arduino based. And I'm gonna explain why I chose to do this, but let's go ahead and get started with the construction of this. First things first, we need to attach some electronics and I'm using my tried and true method of just some simple hot glue to attach the three motor drivers that I will need. Again, all the parts are going to be linked in the description below. Next, I go ahead and attach the Arduino Nano Shield. I'm using an Arduino Nano to control all of the turnouts, and this Nano Shield puts these terminal connections in there, making it easy to wire up. Now it's time to wire everything up, and I'm going to be using wires with DuPont connectors on them. These actually work really great for putting in these terminals for little short runs. Now, each turnout needs two wires to connect to the motor drivers, so I'm going to be using 10 pins on the digital side. Fortunately, I have 13, so that is what we're doing right here. Now, one of the big reasons that I use those DuPont connector wires is that the motor drivers have the DuPont connectors on them, which makes them extremely easy to wire up. Now, they have one, two, three, and four on the pins, so one and two control one of the motors, and three and four control another one. Now, if you're wondering to yourself, this is all great, Jimmy, but how do you know what to wire up and how am I supposed to know what to wire up? Well, I've done an entire video on how not only to wire up a tortoise switch motor, but using slightly different components, how to do a snap switch, and I'll link that at the end of this video. All right, so what I just did was I'm using digital pins 2 through 11 to connect 
to the motor controllers. Now, what this is is basically you gotta have two pins per control just to tell the motors which way to go if you're connecting this to a regular motor. Now, we're gonna be using this to throw the tortoise switch motors in two different directions. So I have all these pins and I've connected them right here. And that is what we are doing right there. To make things easier for wiring everything, I'm going to attach some terminal strips that will make connecting wires a whole lot easier. This one in particular will be used for the five buttons that will control the turnouts and also for the power and ground connections. Now I'll need five connections in total and I'm hooking up the buttons to my analog pins which will be A0 through A4. And each one of these will connect to the terminal where I can split it off and ground the button so that it can read properly. I'm also going to connect a 5 volt connection, a ground connection, and a VIN connection which will power the Arduino. This right here, the red wire, is going to be my 5 volt connection where I can connect things to 5 volt power from the Arduino. And then I'm also going to connect a ground wire right here that's this white wire right here and then I'll also have the VIN connection which is the black wire right here that is what's going to bring power to the Arduino from the eventual 5 volt hub that I hook up. Now because I'm going to have so many ground connections that it might be too much for that single terminal port to share, I'm actually going to put an entire separate smaller terminal strip in just to handle all of my ground connections. I do this using some jumpers to connect all of the terminals together. Next up it was time to hook up all of the ground connections and this is a lot of wiring and you're probably saying to yourself right now, Jimmy this is a ton of wiring period and I'm having trouble following it. Well the bottom line is if I tried to explain all the wiring this video would probably be between 30 minutes and an hour long. But what I did was made you a schematic with everything and I've attached it to the GitHub file with the sketch to load onto the Arduino and I'm going to put a link to all of that in the description below. Now it's time to wire up the tortoise switch machines. Tortoises have eight connections on them and connections one and eight, which are on each end, are for controlling the switch motor. So we'll need to go ahead and attach wires to uh, pad one and eight. These are very easy to solder to. As a matter of fact, they've got a little hole in them that you can hook a wire through and then just drop a little bit of solder. I know that there are connection terminals that you can put on these, but I've never had an issue soldering a tortoise switch machine. Um, it's a super simple process, but all you have to do is that and then we can hook them up to our motor drivers so that we can power them. The L298 motor driver can control two tortoise switch machines at the same time. One of the two terminal connections is for one motor and the other is for the second one. All you have to do is connect your wires there. It doesn't matter which one goes where. It only matters if you are going to be doing some signaling control by the Arduino with the tortoise, then you'll need to know which one goes where so that you can have correct signaling. But that's a whole other issue and we're not tackling that today. Now it's time to install our 12 volt terminal power distributor. You've seen me use similar ones to this on MRR1. They work great for distributing power. They also have a barrel plug jack so that you can just plug any 12 volt DC power supply into it. And then you just connect wires to it and you're ready to go. This one was slightly different though, and I'm going to go over it at the end of the video. This will eventually be used to power anything 12 volt on the layout. Right now, it's just going to be used to power the three motor drivers. So I'm just going to connect those wires up to it. Again, it's a little bit hard to see right here, which is why I created that schematic in the GitHub page, and that is linked in the description below. Now I'm going to need different voltages for different things on this layout, so I figured I'd go ahead and install a different voltage uh, power supply here. Originally I was going to do 5 volts, but I'm actually going to end up having this be a 9 volt power supply. This will power any Arduinos I have without any risk to any of the circuitry. Sure, you could do it without the 12 volt power supply, but this works just fine too. I use a DC barrel plug adapter to go ahead and connect to the power input on this particular terminal. By the way, I use hot glue to attach this one too. That's why you saw me just push it up there. I'm going to have all these parts linked in the description below. And then the next thing that I did was just connect the wires that are going to run power to the Arduino.
I then connected my wires from that terminal to my Arduino using the terminal strip that I had right here, which made wiring it a whole lot easier. It's a lot easier to do these big screw terminals rather than the tiny ones on the Arduino Nano Shield. One of the last things that I did was connect all of the ground connections to the button wires of where they're going to come into the terminal. Now, at first I actually did this incorrectly and I had to do a fix before the final product and I'm going to actually go over that in just a second. Next, I put some power on the layout itself by using some Loctite power grip to glue a power strip onto one of the legs. I always like putting a power strip like this on the layout. It makes it really easy to power. And then we're going to plug everything in. Before I get to running it, I needed to rewrite my Arduino tortoise switch motor code to be able to handle five tortoise switch machines. This is a really complicated thing right here, and it's also very specific, so I didn't want to do a whole tutorial on it, but I am going to put this code up on my GitHub page along with the schematic, and if you want to check out how to control a tortoise switch machine with an Arduino, I've done a whole video on that like I mentioned before, and that will be linked at the end of this video. A couple of things that gave me a little bit of a headache that I wired incorrectly that I just want to go over. One was originally I thought I could just do one resistor for all of the buttons to go to the ground. So I had one resistor right here. Well, that didn't work out and my signals kept getting crossed. So what I ended up doing was doing making these little resistor jumpers with 1K resistors that are put in some heat shrink that connect to wires. And these little jumpers are for each of my five buttons that are going to connect. And that fixed everything just as a 1K resistor resistor connected to some wire that are doing my from the button connection to my ground terminal. Now the other thing that actually gave me a lot of headache and I think it's because I've never encountered one that was created like this is the my 12 volt terminal strip right here and <laughs> The reason that it gave me a headache is a I didn't look at it properly because I bought a ton of these and it looked identical to the rest of them but it actually has little spots for different terminals with your positive and negative rather than having one side be positive and one side be negative which is what literally every other terminal I've ever used like this had so I had everything wired up and I could not get my motor drivers to turn on I have these little lights right here and I could not figure out why and then I looked at it I actually had to grab my voltmeter and I tested it and I was like oh wait this is where I'm getting 12 volts not across this so I just rewired that and that fixed that right up all right, everything is wired up and powered up. And the only thing I have right here is I haven't done buttons on the fascia yet because I plan on making a panel, but I have a little test button wired up right here and we can just see how everything works. So we can see now that everything works. Now there's a lot simpler ways, frankly, to do these tortoise switch machines. And you're probably wondering why, well, Jimmy, why did you decide to use an Arduino and all this complicated wiring to do the tortoise switch machines when you could just use some toggle switches or something like that? Well, first of all, it wouldn't be me if I wasn't using an Arduino. But second of all, this is going to allow for a lot of potential customization. So let's say you want to control multiple turnouts simultaneously with specific functions and things like that. Let's say, for example, you have a yard ladder with these or another type of turnout that you can just modify the code for. You can tell a button to actually control and align switches rather than having to do the manual itself. So you can just have buttons on the specific sidings of a yard ladder rather than having to flip two turnouts you can just hit that one button and it'll align everything simultaneously and because I've done everything right here all I have to do is do some modifications to the code that are fairly simple that would be able to control all of these so when you are looking at something like this it's not necessarily the simple solution but it's going to allow for upgrades and modifications and more complex things down the road so doing all of this work now is going to make things simpler if i want to try something different like let's say with my runaround track having both turnouts on each end 
throw simultaneously to realign everything. So that's why I did all of this. I've still got a lot of work to do. I got to put all the buttons on the fascia. So obviously I'm not going to be reaching under the layout and grabbing a button. So I got to make that panel and put that on there. So I got to make my button leads longer, but everything's just going to hook up right here. It's going to be nice and simple. And I've got to do some cable management because that's not that great. That doesn't, I got I to gotta do some better wire management. <laughs> So that's what I've got going on. I'm nearly finished putting all of the electronics in for MRR2. A lot of cool things going on here. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Until next time, I'm Jimmy from the DIY and Digital. Stay safe, be kind, and happy railroading. I can guarantee you, you've never seen me do what I'm about to do in this video here before. And that is spray paint track. <laughs> Today we're hopping back on the MRR2 Project Railroad for the base coat of paint. Now, typically when I do a base coat of paint, I will use just regular old household latex paint. I actually keep a gallon of just some cheap household interior flat latex paint in the color that I like on hand for these type of situations. But with this layout only being one foot wide by six feet long, it's pretty easy to justify using a can of spray paint. So we're gonna use that, plus I'm gonna show you how I spray paint paint rails to make them look weathered and rusted. So let's go ahead and get to it. The main thing we need to do is protect the turnouts. The rest of this can be repainted or it's not really going to be that big of an issue, but the turnouts, we need to make sure that all the electrical points are okay and solid. So we're gonna take some painter's tape and we're gonna cover them up for when we do spray paint. Spray painting the rest of the track is not gonna be an issue. We just have to make sure we clean off the top so that the connections are great. So let's get started. Now for these large double sections, I'm just gonna cover the entire section of track. There's no point in trying to be skimpy. I've got plenty of tape, so we're gonna go ahead and just cover everything up right there. I'm gonna make sure we get the frogs and everything. And then you wanna make sure that you press it down really, really good. We wanna make sure that we are protecting those points. I go through the process of taping up the remaining turnouts. And again, since they are so close, I just tape them up as one unit. All right, everything is protected and we're gonna paint the entire top. I'm not gonna worry about painting the front or the back and the sides that are gonna be the fascia because I'm still gonna do something else with that. But we're gonna go ahead and start spraying. Just a quick reminder, make sure that you do this in a well-ventilated space. Don't need to be hoffing any fumes or anything like that. That's actually the reason why I'm doing it in my garage because when I'm done, I can just open this thing up and vent everything out. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna go ahead and partially open my garage for venting the fumes. Now, one thing about this is we are painting the rails. Now, one thing you wanna make sure you have on hand is something to wipe the tops of the rails off so that you can still get an electrical connection. I've just got some paper towels right here. You can use something like a shop towel or whatever you have on hand, just as long as you're ready to quickly clean off the tops of the rails after the coat of paint has gone on them. So, but for that reason also, we're gonna go ahead and spray paint everything else around so that the last thing that we do is the rails and we don't have to worry about any paint spatter after we paint the rails. So let's get started. Now, the first thing I will say is that I do not recommend using purely spray paint for a base coat on a large project. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not very cost effective. You'll notice that I'm giving the track a wide margin when I'm painting. I do not want to get any of my paint on the track until I'm ready for that. All right, so now we're ready to paint the rails. I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on this process. I've got my paper towel ready. I'm gonna put it way over here and we're gonna to get to painting this section. Let's go ahead and get started. I am doing short bursts of painting. This is so that my paint coat on the rails is as even as I can possibly make it. This also gives me a lot more control over the paint. As soon as I am done painting, I need to wipe the top of the rails clean. I use the paint can lid with a paper towel wrapped around it so that I can have a flat surface to wipe the paint with. Once I've done the entire railroad, I'll let it dry. All right, everything is pretty dry. There's still some wet spots, but I can go ahead and start working on it. So now it's time to go ahead and paint those turnouts. I'll be using micro brushes and simple brown acrylic paint to paint the rails. 
We can now remove the tape and get to painting. And this is a bit tedious. When painting, you'll want to get the micro brush into the web of the rail and try to avoid the top of the rail as much as possible. If your track has black ties, you'll want to paint the ties here as well. You will paint the inside and outside web of the rail, and I would just avoid the points where the turnout mechanism contacts the other track. Now, I ended up deciding to spray paint the rest of the turnouts except for where the points contact the rails. So I grabbed my tape again and just taped over the extremely sensitive parts. If you don't feel comfortable spray painting parts of the turnout, go ahead and continue to use the micro brush technique. I did one last bit of paint and then wipe the top of the rails clean. And there it is, nice and painted. I'm probably just gonna let the ballasting whenever I do it, just kind of cover up the areas to where I had it taped off, but there you go. Painting your track is something that you may have never thought of doing before, but it's what a lot of the big timers in the industry do to make their model railroad look even more realistic. It's just one of those little things you can do to add a little bit more realism to your layout. Now you have to do it during this phase of construction because you can't come back and use an airbrush or anything like that on it. You'd have to use pure micro brushes or paint pens or things like that. And that would probably be a nightmare depending on the size of your layout. So if you're building your layout and you want to paint your track, now is the time to do it. Thank you all so, so much for watching. Until next time, I'm Jimmy from the DIY and Digital. Stay safe, be kind, and happy railroading. When we last left off, MRR2 had been painted and was ready to begin the scenic work. That episode will be linked at the end of this video. Ballasting is one of those things that you need to get right when you do it. It is not the easiest thing in the world to redo. So before we begin, I want to mark where the road will be crossing the track. I'll be using the Walther's Concrete Road Kit and Grade Crossing Kit to make the road. Now, I've actually never used these products before, but I found them easy and fairly intuitive to use. I took pieces of the road and roughly laid them out and then marked the edges with a Sharpie on the cork roadbed. Now, I can begin ballasting. I'm using Woodland Scenic's medium gray ballast for this, and I think it works fairly well, not only in terms of size, but in terms of color as well, as just a general ballast color. If you are doing in scale, I do recommend switching to the fine ballast as its size is more appropriate. I start by lining the side of the cork roadbed with white glue using a foam brush. I'm only doing the sides because the glue I apply later will help everything stick to the top and in between the ties. I then begin pouring the ballast. For long sections of track like this, I like to use the cap from the shaker that the ballast came in to spread it around. I then use a one inch chip brush to spread the ballast and neaten it up to where I like it. A quick thing that you wanna do is just take your finger and make sure that you have everything nice and smooth and you get everything out of the webbing of the rail. Now that the ballast is in place, I'm gonna to need to glue it down. And I'm using a tried and true method of isopropyl alcohol and scenic cement, which is a fancy term for white glue and water. I used to go for a 50-50 mix of white glue and water, and now I lean more towards a 60-40 or even a 70-30 mixture sometimes with more water than glue. This goes through the spray bottle a lot easier than that 50-50. Another thing that I do is I mix up all of the scenic cement in a separate bottle and then pour it in into the sprayer. This gets any thick globs of that white glue and keeps them really from pouring into the bottle and being sucked into the spray nozzle. So do it in a separate bottle when you make your own scenic cement. I start by soaking the ballast with IPA. Now here I'm using 91% IPA. You can really go as low as 70%. I really wouldn't use 50%, but 70% is the one that I've used and still have plenty of success, but 91% works really, really well. If you do not have IPA, you can use what's called wet water, which is water with a few drops of dish soap, just your standard dish soap like Dawn or something. This just takes way, way longer to dry, like days to dry totally versus IPA, which dries in a matter of hours. You use IPA or wet water to release the surface tension on top of the ballast. This helps the glue soak in rapidly like this.
If you don't use something to release surface tension, you're gonna get little glue droplets on top of your ballast and nothing is going to glue correctly. And even if it gets flat, you're gonna get this nasty little crust on top of your ballast that easily chips off. Once the ballast is soaked, I apply the glue. If you have a bottle that can miss this mixture, that's great. I buy my spray bottles from the dollar store and they cannot mist. So I use them more as droppers than actual spray bottles. This is because if I spray in the streams, it's gonna make little globs pop up and make my ballast uneven. But I do the little drops by gently pressing the trigger to regulate how many drops come out. If your bottle gets a little clogged while holding it sideways, have a place where you can hold it upright and blast it clear. Once this is done, you can let the ballast dry. So while that's going on, we're going to do the most nerve wracking part of ballasting turnouts. Turnouts have several moving parts and have multiple points of failure, so you have to be extra careful ballasting them. The first big difference you will see me doing is that I use a spoon to gently spread small amounts of ballast. I'm doing the steps in the same order, just with a lot more care and control. When ballasting the side, I do as little as possible near any of the moving parts. Once the sides are done, I use the spoon again to place very small amounts in each section. I'm very careful about joints and areas that need clearance to move. Inevitably, you're gonna get a few pieces of ballast where you don't want them. To clear them, I have found that using a clean and dry one inch foam brush with a point will clear away any excess ballast that is in the way. I use this on the turnout mechanism as well as the frogs and it works great. Now it is time to glue the ballast down. It starts the same with misting and soaking all of the ballast with IPA. After this, I very meticulously put drops of my scenic glue in between each tie. I usually only do one drop per gap and that is enough for when it soaks through everywhere. When I'm working my way through the mechanisms of the point, I put the glue in the middle to avoid getting it into the web of the rails as much as possible. Once that is all done, I can let it dry. Now for the final part, which is the grade crossing. Now the kit I bought is designed to work a bit better with a level crossing, but it works fine for this. I start by putting the pieces back in the layout in a more accurate positioning than I did before. I then mark my cut points for the road at the edge so that I can trim those off. Now I can begin placing the outer sides of the crossing. I use super glue to put these in place, and it is my personal favorite Starbond Thick Super Glue. I'll have a link to that in the description below. I'm not doing the interior piece just yet because that is an extremely important section that I do not want to do without testing it with rolling stock. You may also notice that I have not painted these sections either like I normally would. That is because of two things. One, these are already a concrete-ish color, so paint isn't strictly necessary for the whole thing. And two, I will need to fill in the excess areas, the little gaps, with model putty and smooth them on the road. So even if I did paint, I'd have to come back and paint again. So I've decided that a light paint and weather technique will be used when I get to that step. Now I start laying the road as per the instructions on the kit. I put the road peak sections in and glue the road sections to it. I then use my knockoff Dremel to cut the edge sections to size and then glue them in place. I will link this rotary tool in the description below. I really like it. I glue everything else in place and then you use a piece of rolling stock to glue the middle section of the crossing in place and make sure that it has clearance. The last thing I need to do is ballast the track around the crossing and then I'm done. Okay, let's slap a train on this and give it a test run. We're going to be putting down a base level of scenery today, and for that we'll be starting with Woodland Scenic's Burnt Earth Fine Scenic Foam. I use white glue to secure it down, but I don't get too close to the ballast to track with the white glue. I'm going to glue it down later. 
Now, you may be thinking that I should start with a green base and work in the brown, but if you look at aerial shots of the ground, you'll see actually a lot more brown than green. So the burnt earth layer looks good for a base layer. Now, when you are laying the scenery material close to the track, I like to use this technique. I put the material in a cup or lid like this, and I tap it with my finger with the open face away from the track, but right over the edge of the ballast line. This allows for a clean line on the ballast, but still keeps that natural look. After this, we can spread out burnt earth evenly everywhere throughout the layout using the same techniques. Notice that I'm avoiding the area with the street scene. It's going to be a little bit different, and that's going to take a lot more work, and we're going to tackle that in another video. Okay, this is where the change comes into play. Originally, I was going to put a couple of multi-story buildings and building fronts right here, and you can still do that if you're building this, but I thought about it and realized, hey, this layout's going to move a lot, and I don't want too much that can break easily. So I decided to put a single building in the middle of these tracks and imply that there is more here off layout. With that being said, I'm going to gravel this whole area right here. I put it over the scenic material using the same techniques I use for the scenery. This is a Woodland Scenics gravel kit and it has two components, a ballast and a dirt dust material to weather it. I now soak the entire area with IPA to release that surface tension and then use a cake icing squeeze bottle to put my scenic cement on. Cool new thing that I found. And then I let it dry. While that is drying, I'm going to be building this Pike Stuff kit for the area in the middle of the layout. These kits are great and easy to assemble and customize. They fit in most places pretty well. I've actually got an in-scale one on my main layout. Back on the layout, everything has dried rock solid so that I can take that dust and put it on the gravel. But I'm not going to just use it on the gravel. This is a great weathering powder that can kind of bring everything together. So I'm going to sprinkle some on the track, sprinkle some on the gravel, and just kind of let it all mix and mingle there. And then just use a brush to kind of dust it into place. So the building is built and the scenery has dried and everything is good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and just gently set the building on the layout. This is not permanent right now. I still have a lot of work to do to the building before it goes on there, but just want to see where it's going to go. But you can check this out. Our scenic base is complete for this area. You can't do a base like these for all areas of your layout, hence the lack of anything in my town scene, but this is a good way to cover a lot of ground if you need to. It doesn't take a ton of time to learn or do, and it's a pretty forgiving method as well. Now, I kind of want to show you guys some trains running on this now. I bought this Broadway Limited SW7 in the Atlantic Coastline paint scheme used on eBay. Got a pretty good deal on it. It's got great sound and detail as well as added capacitance, which some of you may know as a keep alive. This means it has a capacitor that keeps it running even when the track is dirty and it can't supply power. The effect is short lived, but it's enough to get it to an area where the locomotive can pick up some power again. So it makes it really handy for smooth, slow operation. Yeah, I made a bit of a boo-boo on my MRR2 Project Railroad. So today, I'm gonna fix it. So you may remember that I did not paint or weather my road when I installed it. This is because I had planned on blending it in with the scenery as I was going along. Well, that wasn't the best idea. And if you wanna watch that video, I'll post it at the end. And But by the time that I realized this, it was too late. I still needed to get the road colored and I wanted to paint it with a technique that I've gotten quite good at, which is using spray paint. But 
this was going to pose a real challenge because, you know, the rope was already glued in place. Now, to be 100% clear, this is not the best way to do this in terms of painting your road or anything like that. You want to do it beforehand. The best way would have been to pre-spray paint everything. But if you've already done this or you need to make a change on your layout, I want to show you how I did it so you can know that there is a way to do it. So here is how I fixed my screw up. First of all, I had not installed the sidewalks. Thank goodness, because this would have been a whole lot harder that way. So I went ahead and got my sidewalk pieces and started cutting them to size, as well as some 0.04 inch styrene that is going to serve as the base for the two buildings that are gonna go in my little town scene right here. This is my first time using these Walters kits overall, and I just wanna say that they've been a relative breeze to work with. I'm, they're not sponsoring this. They've just been really, really good. I used my rotary tool to cut the sidewalk edges and just some simple head heavy duty shears to cut the styrene to size. I wasn't having to do anything absolutely perfect. I just needed it to fit to the edge of the layout. Now, it's time to start painting. First thing I did was I grabbed some painter's tape and began sealing off the edges of the road and crossing. I then grabbed a garbage bag, I ripped it in half so that I had basically an impromptu drop cloth, and I took it and kind of worked it around the edges where I had taped for getting the edges and then taped the garbage bag to that painter's tape and that held it in place. This little note here that it was a lot easier to use some wider painter's tape for this because it gave me a little bit more flexibility with it. So I wanted to start with my chalkboard gray color paint. This is like my favorite uh, color for doing concrete in terms of spray paint and I just did a few brief bursts across the road. Uh, don't worry about getting it on the tracks if you're doing this. We're going to get to that in a minute, but have some water ready and a micro brush and a set or a similar tool. Next, I use some matte black spray paint with the same technique. I use two-in-one spray paint and primer, which works pretty well. The random bursts of paint that I give the road give it a more weathered and textured look that just looks overall more realistic and it's a pretty easy way to achieve this realistic look and it's really really great and it served me really well over several road projects. To clean the rails I did it as soon as I was done painting and I used a micro brush with some water to wipe off as much paint off the rails as I could. If that doesn't work some sort of scraping tool can be used to remove the paint. Think about like a hobby knife or something like that. I actually used a flathead screwdriver and it worked pretty well. Now, while that paint was drying, I went ahead and went to paint the sidewalks and the styrene bases for the buildings using a similar technique, except for the fact that I'm spraying them before I'm putting them in place, like a smart person. The main difference here is I use more of the gray on the sidewalks with just a touch of black, and then for the bases, I just did the exact same thing that I did for the roads because I want it to look like it's just asphalt with a little bit of a curb in between it. Once everything was dry, I can start to glue everything in place and I used a gel-based super glue for this. If you're gluing plastic on plastic, you can use something like plastic cement, but I'm doing plastic on wood, so this gel-based super glue was a great choice. I'll link it below. I then drilled some holes for building lights. The small of these two buildings is actually the one that I did the custom random light project with Arduinos on there, so uh, I can link that at the end as well, so you can check that out. And the larger of the two buildings is actually one that I built for a series on Train Masters TV, and I will link Train Masters TV in the description below. Once that is dry, I can put the base scenery in and around what I glued on. This includes some extra ballast around the track and also the scenic areas leading from the industry to the town. I can finally complete those and get everything linked up. With all of that, my base scenery is complete. The base layer that I'm going to put everything on there and all that's left on MRR2 is the detailing in terms of scenery. You can see that it's really starting to look like a little switching layout now. Detailing to me is one of the really fun parts and I cannot wait to show you guys how I do that on here because I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, that hurt. Static Grass is a transformative scenic product, and when done correctly, it looks so good. I mean, really good. The results can be shocking. See, see what I did there? 
Now before we begin with the static grass, I'm going to install these woodland scenic trees. I'm going to glue the bases on rather than simply drilling a hole because this layout is going to be mobile and I need to be able to remove the trees, but I still wanted a good looking base. So I super glued the bases on the board and we will come back to those later. Now it's time for static grass. Before we begin anything, make sure your layout is off and unplugged just to be safe. One static pop in the wrong place could fry some circuitry. Wait, 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 wait. What is static grass? So if you've ever seen a balloon rubbed on someone's hair and the hair stands up, static grass works in a similar way. Static grass is a series of fibers that will stand up when a charge is applied using an applicator. I will link some static grass applicators below. The static grass applicator will have a wire coming out of it that connects to the medium you are applying the grass to, which is usually something like white glue. Then the charge runs from that wire through the fibers to the other end of the applicator. This is what causes the fibers to stand up. Now this is static electricity and you can get shocked if you are too close. Like I did. So keep the wire end a bit further away from the applicator and you don't have to move it along close as long as it's connected to the medium. Now for this project I'm using some Woodland Scenics light and medium green static grass in 4mm and 7mm lengths. If you're doing in scale you can also find this in 2mm lengths as well. To apply the grass, you load the applicator's hopper, which has some metal in it to complete the circuit with the charged fibers. Once full, you shake it gently to disperse the fibers. The fibers should mostly stand on end and follow the applicator. You don't need to directly touch the applicator to the fibers. Just getting it close enough is going to get that charge to get them to stand up. If they don't stand up like that, you can also just gently wave the applicator while you have it activated over the fibers to get them to stand up. I will also sometimes hover the applicator straight over the grass and then jerk it straight upwards so that it will leave the grass standing straight up when the charge is no longer there. You can mix the grasses or shake them on separately. Variety is key for looking natural unless you're doing something like a lawn you are going to have some spillage and we're going to address that a little bit later. For the area with the trees, I went a little lighter with the static grass because trees will typically inhibit its growth. I also put a little bit of burnt earth turf around the bases to blend them in better. And I also use some of this underbrush that you can pull apart to add some unkempt bushes around the base of the trees. You can also use static grass for small areas and tufts of grass as well. Simply spread the glue exactly where you want the grass to go and shake some static grass onto it with your applicator. Do this wherever you want some overgrowth. I actually really enjoy putting static grass on the track at the ends of sidings. It is pretty easy and it makes it look really great and really disused and like it's been there a while. Now you just need to let the grass dry. Once that is done, you're probably thinking, hey, this looks great, but there's a lot of extra on it. You'll need to remove the grass, but you don't want to waste it. So you'll take some hosiery or anything that will not let the fibers through and place it over a vacuum tube like my shock vac here. Then suck up the grass and use the hosiery to catch it before it goes into the vacuum. Once you're done with all this, it doesn't hurt to clean your track a little bit either. Static grass can really make your railroad pop. Just look at some of these pictures I took. I wired my MRR2 project model railroad for push button control of the turnouts, but I need a panel for all those buttons. Last month I showed you the Ortor LM3 20 watt laser cutter and engraver. It has some pretty cool applications including custom engraving and cutting of certain materials. Now, you're probably seeing custom panels uh, with track plans and buttons for turnouts on other larger layouts like club layouts and display layouts and things like that. Today we're going to use the LM3 to design a custom panel for MRR2. 
We're going to start in some sort of drawing and design software. Now, I'm going to be using Adobe Illustrator here, but you can use anything you can design in and export out a picture file, like a JPEG or a PNG file. We draw our track plan using the software and type out the name of the railroad, which in this case is MRR2. If you're doing this for a specific area, you can put the name of the town or the industrial area or industry or things like that. Now, once we have the design, we can export our image and we're going to export this image as a PNG. Now, that's just the image file, the name of a file picture like JPEG and things like that. So just make sure it's something like a JPEG or a PNG. We can then go to our laser cutter software, which I'm using Lightburn for this. Lightburn is a paid program and that's because I'm using a Mac and it works pretty well. But if you have a PC, there's actually several free programs that you can use. We take our image, size and center it, and then we can add cut lines for the panel, eight millimeter holes for the push buttons, and then I can cut some supports for the panel to angle it. Now, spoiler alert, I'm probably not gonna use those supports. I then check the work area by clicking the frame button, and this just kind of goes around the edge of the work area to make sure that everything is on the piece of wood. Once I have the design centered and sized for the piece of wood, I can start the process. I ordered the layers that it was going to print by having the first layer be the image that I want on there engraved first so that if the cuts caused some shifting when they were happening that it wouldn't screw up the plan for lasering and engraving the image on there. Now when you are running this machine and cutting wood it can put out some smoke and I mean it can really put out some smoke because it is burning things in there. The pattern takes about 15 minutes to complete. The design was a single pass that engraved the image and the cut was about 15 passes to complete the cut all the way through the wood. And here we go. Next, I need to add the buttons. I bought these pre-wired buttons on Amazon. I'm using different colors so that I can tell my kids what color button to hit when we're having fun with it. The buttons come with nuts and washers, so attaching it to anything is going to be pretty easy as long as you've got the right sized hole for it. All I have to do is attach the buttons and we are good to go. And here's the panel. It came out really, really great. You can see I got all the wires out there ready to be wired up. Now, I'm going to be doing the final update on MRR2 later this month, and I will be attaching this panel to the layout among other things. And I'm extremely happy with the way that this turned out. So it's been a long time since I started this project. And today I can finally reveal MRR2. MRR2 is my second project railroad on this channel and my first HO scale railroad. This is a 1x6 HO scale switching layout that is designed more as a switching puzzle than a prototypical railroad. The layout is built with Atlas Code 83 track and at number 4 turnouts and it runs off DCCEX using the latest update with the DCCEX 5.0. I started with 1x4s and 1x3s creating L girder bench work. The layout deck is a 1 inch by 18 inch by 6 foot board that I bought pre-cut. The track was laid using cork roadbed and Loctite power grab which is a similar product to liquid nails. Once the track was laid, I was able to attach power feeders by soldering them to the track. I also used frog juicers to power my turnout frogs. The turnouts are controlled with tortoise switch machines that are remotely activated by these buttons. This panel is a custom panel and I created it with a laser cutter. For ballasting and ground cover, I use my normal techniques for ballast and ground cover using Woodland Scenics products. 
I started with Ballas and The Road, which is a Walther Street kit, and I did the basic ground cover. After the scenic base was applied, I used some bushes, trees, and static grass to finish out the scenery. The last step that I needed to do to functionally complete the layout was to add some detail. Since I plan on making the layout mobile, I glued everything down. But this means I need to figure out positioning. Then I glued out everything, including the vehicles, so that it was easy to move. The two town buildings are design preservation model kits, and one industry building is a Pike Stuff kit from Rick's Products. The design of the industry is to make it general enough to allow for a multitude of car types. For rolling stock, I'm trying to stick to right around 40 foot cars because of the size of the layout. The locomotive is a Broadway Limited SW7 that I bought used on eBay and it works great. I control the entire layout through DCCEX in their latest version as of shooting this video and use my phone for the throttle and features. Now, Unfortunately, you cannot hear the sounds very well because I shot this outside in August and all you can hear is my air conditioner. So why did I build MRR2? Well, MRR1 was a starter in-scale layout that can be built by anyone as long as you have enough space for it, which is you don't really need that much space. MRR2 is another space efficient layout that introduces people to the concept of both a switching layout and a shelf layout. Shelf layouts focus mainly on modeling the area right around the track and don't take up nearly as much space. Matter of fact, they take up significantly less space than an oval and lend themselves to more prototypical operations. This is a layout that most beginners and even intermediate modelers don't think about, but can be a ton of fun. They can also be cost effective to build and allow you to spend more money on locomotives and rolling stock. Yes, you're not gonna be running a big boy on MRR2 but there are still quite a few locomotives that you can run on this. MRR2 is designed to get you to think outside the oval and open people up to the idea of a shelf or switching layout. Now, you may note that I said functionally complete for MRR2. That doesn't necessarily mean that I'm done and this is the last you're going to see of it. I've got a lot of cool different detailing projects and all sorts of weathering and even a few electronics projects for MRR2 still in the planning stages. So this will not be the last you see of this little switching layout. Now, I have created a playlist with all the videos that is available right here as well as I'm making a mega compilation of the videos that will be out soon. So be on the lookout for that. Until next time, I'm Jimmy from the DIY and Digital. Stay safe, be kind, and happy railroading.